In Hebrews chapter 8, we see what I've termed the continuity of the covenant. The continuity of the covenant, meaning the Old Covenant, the Old Testament law of Moses, and the New Covenant in Christ, the New Testament hope, the gospel. To understand that, I think we should begin by thinking about the world we live in. We live in a society that loves the new and improved. We love new and improved things. We get new smartphones every year or two. We get new cars. Some people every three years get a new vehicle. Uh, Many people change houses throughout their lifetimes, wanting something new, something different, not just because they've outgrown their old one. We like new things until they become old to us, and then we need something else that's new. Some people, on the other hand, are afraid of new things. We, We either embrace change and get excited about it, or at times we reject change and push back out of fear or frustration. We know the new and improved can help us to be more productive. It can open up new possibilities help you to save money even. Think about LED lights or um, high efficiency furnaces in your home. There are new things that we know are very beneficial and there's plenty of repairmen who will tell you it's time to replace that, especially when they get commission on the sale. Sometimes though, we trust what's old and familiar. Sometimes it's hard to give the old away in exchange for the new. I can think of some that happened just recently. When we went to Colorado and I needed hiking boots, I went to pack my old ones and they smelled really bad. They're 12 year old Timberland boots. They've seen me through a lot of different jobs and hiking trips and a lot of fun things. I used to landscape in those boots. And to be honest, they've held up really well. To be 12 years old, they're in good shape. But odor eaters couldn't save them. I mean, every day, I washed them, dried them outside in the sun multiple times. I, I put odor eaters in every time I wore them. It just didn't matter. They smelled, and they didn't just smell like stinky feet. It was all the stuff I had done. It smelled like wet grass. They smelled, that really was the main smell, was wet grass from all the weed eating I had done in those boots. They just stunk, and I thought, I can't put those in a suitcase with all my nice clothes on this trip. I'm going to have to get new boots. Now, when it comes time to get something new in exchange for the old and reliable, something you trusted in, you often need somebody to convince you that the new is worth it. For me, that's Kylie, my wife. She convinces me when it's time to upgrade. And it's not just boots. Sometimes she talks about upgrading other things, like our refrigerator, for example. Uh, It came with the house. It's old. It's dented up. I get it. It's it's a refrigerator. It's a box that keeps your food cold. So it's going to be hard to convince me to buy a new one. But then she points out, whenever the ads come in the mail, hey, look at this new one. It doesn't show fingerprints. And of course, with three little kids at home, that is kind of a nice thought that our fridge would look pretty because the one we have now is rough. And it's bigger, holds more food, and it doesn't leak water all over our kitchen floor like the one we have now does sometimes. And I've tried to fix it, and I've watched the YouTube videos, and I don't know what's wrong. If you want to try to fix it, talk to me after church. The problem is that our fridge technically still works. It keeps food cold. It may not be the best option, but it's an option and it's free. And sometimes that's how we view life. We know the new is exciting. It's interesting. It opens up maybe new possibilities. It does the job more efficiently, whatever. The old is just sometimes what we're used to and it's hard to move on. But we know deep down that nothing in this world is designed to last forever. We know that. That's why we replace appliances. It's why we buy new shoes, because nothing is meant to last forever. Now, I want you to take that simple truth about the world we live in, that nothing lasts forever, and apply it to the story of God and his people. When God formed a covenant with Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, I promise this is all going to catch back up to Hebrews 8. You'll see. In Genesis 12, God makes promises to Abraham. He says, Abram, I'll make you Abraham, a father of many. It was new and exciting. Later, God would take a descendant of Abraham named Moses and help him lead the people in a great exodus out of Egypt. And then he would make a covenant on stone with those people. He would put his law on tablets and give them to his people. And they would put those tablets, these sacred relics, in an ark of a covenant that no one could touch because it was the mercy seat of God, his footstool. And it was housed in the most holy of holies where only one man could go inside one time a year within the tabernacle. They treated it with great respect. 
those things were new and exciting. When God showed up, it was awesome. But you might know what happens as the story continues. Eventually, Abraham's descendants not only forgot what God had promised, but they rejected God completely. Many of them began worshiping false gods and idols. The tablets that were stored in the Ark of the Covenant, no one to this day knows where they are. No one knows where the Ark of the Covenant is. It was lost in battle, never to be seen again. Perhaps Indiana Jones could tell you, but that's about it. And my boots stunk more and more and more no matter how many times I washed them. And that fridge does leak every week or two. It'll just pour water all over the floor. And I still don't know exactly what's going on. We know that eventually we need new things, but we also know we don't have to have the new thing until the old breaks down or is no longer reliable. So sometimes we put it off. Hebrews 8 is going to take that simple truth about things not lasting forever and knowing that they have to be replaced eventually. And the author of Hebrews will apply it to God's covenant, which is kind of a unique thing to consider. So look at Hebrews chapter 8 with me. And consider the context of Hebrews. These Hebrew readers were Jewish people. We're pretty confident about that. These were Jewish people. They belonged under the law of Moses. At the very least, their ancestors did. And they worshiped in a temple. If this was written, this is kind of an amazing thought. If this was written before AD 70, and some scholars think it was, then the temple is still in Jerusalem being used. There are high priests in the temple making sacrifices. And if this was written after AD 70, well, now the temple's gone. It's been destroyed. Jerusalem has been sacked by Rome. And now there are no high priests making offerings in the temple, no sacrifices. And the people are probably concerned. This old covenant, this old arrangement with God, it wasn't designed to last forever. Jesus knew that. But many of his followers seem to struggle to believe it. Perhaps we should stop here to consider what we even mean by covenant. Covenant's a weird word. Mary Ann Beavis says the concept of covenant, the Greek word is diatheke, dominates this section of Hebrews. It's used to undergird the ethical teaching throughout the remainder of the discourse, meaning everything Hebrews teaches us is based on the concept of covenant. But as confusing as diatheke sounds, I think covenant can be just as confusing for us English speakers. We don't know what covenant means. We don't often use the word covenant in our casual speech. But I can tell you this, even though it occurs all over the Bible, it is really a simple concept. It is the relational agreement or the faithful bond between God and his people. It's the relational agreement or the faithful bond between God and his people. At its very simplest, a covenant is a marriage. It's a tying together forever of two parties. In this case, God and his beloved people. The closest we have to this covenant is earthly marriage, where a husband and a wife pledge themselves till death do them part. It's a serious business to pledge oneself to God. And as beautiful as all that sounds, Hebrews will explain that the old covenant wasn't designed to last forever. We might say it was meant until death did them part. But really, it was meant to point to a new one. The old covenant might better be understood as the engagement period. And I hope you'll allow me to overuse the analogy of marriage today, because I think it really helps. If the new covenant in Christ is our marriage to God, then the old covenant, the law of Moses, would have been the period of engagement, where we learn more and more about God and about ourselves and come to the point where we make the final eternal commitment. And that period of engagement had to come to an end at some point when a wedding would take place. So what we see in the Old Covenant is not a failure on God's part when he creates the New Covenant. It's not that God is dissolving his relationship with his people, but he's making it stronger and more enduring. God is not divorcing his beloved. He's showing a deeper and more sacrificial kind of love, a love that reaches beyond the earthly to the heavenly. To understand this, I want to divide Hebrews 8 into three sections. First, the heavenly high priest, which is verses 1 through 5. Second, the heavenly presence, 
which is verses 6 through 10a. And finally, the heavenly life, verses 10b through 13. So we have the heavenly priest or high priest, the heavenly high priest, the heavenly presence, and the heavenly life. First, verses 1 through 5. The words will be on the screen. Hebrews 8, 1 through 5. Now, the point of what we're saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus, it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God saying, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. We'll stop there. The heavenly high priest, the first movement here, the heavenly high priest only makes sense in light of the preceding chapter. Because Hebrews 8 begins by saying, the point of what we're saying is this, we have to remember what he said in chapter seven. So let me refresh you. The author describes Jesus as the high priest of the order of Melchizedek, which is a great honor from the Old Testament. It's also a strange phrase that we could spend a whole sermon trying to understand. Jesus serves then as a new intercessor between humankind and God because the former intercessors were temporary. They were imperfect. As mentioned, if the temple was still around, there were imperfect men serving in that temple. And if it was destroyed, those men were very recently serving in that temple. And now the Jews are looking for who will serve in their temple, who will come before God on their behalf. And so 8 verse 3 harkens back to chapter 7, to these deficiencies in the Old Testament priesthood, in the Old Covenant. There are two in particular. Verse 23 of chapter 7 says that they were mortals. They were earthly priests, meaning they died and they had to be replaced. And then verse 27 says they were imperfect They had to make continual sacrifices for themselves, let alone for the people. And so that's two big strikes against them. They themselves are temporary human beings, and worse than that, they are imperfect human beings. We needed a better high priest. And so we learn three important truths about Jesus in these first five verses of chapter 8. If you'll allow me, this first point has three more sub-points underneath. Jesus serves in the throne room of God. That's the first two verses. Jesus serves in the throne room of God. Secondly, Jesus has something new to offer, verses three and four. And thirdly, Jesus is the substance of the earthly shadow. So first, Jesus serves in the throne room of God. The phrase throne room of God already transports us to the ethereal, into God's presence. We begin to picture something bigger and better than a temple, and we're meant to. This is not the corrupted house of worship from the Old Testament. Jesus doesn't serve in a house built by the hands of men. The author of Hebrews is drawing attention to the temple of his own day. Many of you might know this. Herod had rebuilt the temple. They call it the second temple because the first temple was built by Solomon and it was destroyed. Before that, there was a tabernacle that Moses directed over the construction. Uh, they, then later, they build this second temple after the Solomonic temple is destroyed. So we're talking about Herod's temple. Now, Solomon's temple surely had become corrupted over the years, but Herod's temple started in corruption from the beginning when he built it. It was never the right place of worship for God's people. And we could study quite a bit of history there, but to spare you details, just know Herod's temple is not a good place. Now, you know that because of the Gospels. For example, Matthew 21, Jesus drives out the commercial systems in Herod's temple, and he accuses the people of turning his father's house of prayer into a den of thieves or a den of robbers. Yeah, you're familiar with the story because corruption was so rampant in the temple, Jesus had to make a leather whip and drive cattle out and flip the tables of money changers. There was corruption. There was abuse of the poor. Even in the house of worship, Jesus is now telling us through the author of Hebrews, he doesn't serve in that place. He's better than those high priests. First, because he serves in a better location. Jesus serves in the throne room of God. You can trust in God's throne throne room. There is no abuse of power 
and no possibility of corruption. You can rest in that. Secondly, Jesus has something new to offer. Verses three and four. The primary job of the priesthood, as most of us know, is to offer atonement for the people. They would atone for their own sins and then they would atone for the people's sins. Every priest offers gifts to God. But we also acknowledge that under the law of Moses, those gifts were imperfect. What they offered were animals and grain sacrifices. These were earthly goods and creatures. Now, you might find a lamb without blemish, but all you mean by that is your choicest lamb. We all know there is no perfect lamb without blemish, and there's no perfect crop. We're just getting the best that we have and giving it to God, but really we needed something better than the best that we have. God's people needed a lasting sacrifice, a gift that wouldn't have to be repeatedly offered over and over again, something that could sustain, something with permanence. Something, as Hebrews 9, verse 9 says, could perfect the conscience. And then in verse 12 of chapter 9, this is what we find. He entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. Jesus isn't just serving in a better place. He's offering a better gift, his own blood the only offering that could secure a lasting redemption for God's people. And so Jesus gave his life. And thirdly, Jesus is the substance of the earthly shadow. Verse five reminds us that all of the rituals, all of the system that had been created in the old covenant, all of it was was a shadow of something to come. And there's a quote here from Exodus where God in chapter 25, verse 40, tells Moses to build the tabernacle a very specific way. And he gives them excruciatingly detailed plans, like the details of how many gold pomegranates to hang around stuff. If you ever read it, it's very detailed. And there's clearly some kind of blueprint involved. And the reference here in Hebrews 8 is that that blueprint comes from a main source, There's some thing that the blueprint of the tabernacle was based on. And it's not a place so much as a person, namely Jesus Christ. He is the image that the blueprint is based on. He's the authentic thing, the one that we all look to. Jesus is, in that way, the embodiment of the temple, the priesthood, the sacrifices, and even the law itself. We see that in his earthly life, during his ministry, He shows us what it looks like to be the substance of all that we have only seen in shadows. The Apostle Paul in the book of Revelation talk about temples, but they say that we become temples. Paul and John the Revelator, they say that we become temples. If that's true, and we know the glory of Solomon's temple that we talked about, and now we become the temples, then we should celebrate that God would put his glory and his majesty inside of people like us, that he would create in us the image of Jesus. That in the same way that Moses needed a blueprint to base the tabernacle on, God will create in us a reflection of Jesus so that his presence can be there. It's an amazing thought. It's an overwhelming thought. And that leads to the second main idea in Hebrews 8, the heavenly presence. So the heavenly priest creates the possibility for God's presence to enter. And that's what we find in verses 6 through 10. Hebrews chapter 8, beginning in verse 6. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, There would have been no occasion to look for a second. For he finds fault with them when he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant. And so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. We'll stop there partway through verse 10. The heavenly presence. 
Once we grasp the way in which Jesus serves as a better high priest, a heavenly high priest, then we have to consider what the point of his intercession is. Why is he interceding between us and God? Where is he trying to lead us to? Again, a covenant is best understood as the marriage between God and his people. If Jesus is the perfect heavenly high priest, then he must be able to bring us further into the presence of God. Not locked out of the Holy of Holies, where only one man can go one day a year, but having torn the veil, he brings us into the presence. We should note here that covenants are always marked by atonement, ratified with bloodshed. And there's no exception to that rule. From Adam to Noah to Abraham to the Passover, God included bloodshed as the means of sealing a covenant. And it reminds me with this marriage analogy of wedding rings. We wear wedding bands, wedding rings, because they're costly, they're precious, they're significant because for most of us, they cost money. I mean, I was fresh out of college, so Kylie's isn't very expensive, but some of you have very expensive wedding rings. And it's a sign of the importance of the vows you made. At the time, it was all that I could spend, I spent to show her how much I loved her. Because that picture is a reminder. That's why we wear them every day. It's a reminder, a seal of the promises that are made. God needed to seal the promises that he had made. And the blood of bulls and goats wasn't enough. And so Jesus, when he offers himself, not merely as the high priest, but the sacrifice as well, he then seals the promises of God, forming a sort of metaphorical wedding ring. He, he puts the stamp on the vows that we've made. Once Jesus has done that, once the, once the certificate is signed and the rings are on the hands, and the wedding is over, then comes the good part. If you trust this person and the promises they made, then you move in together and start a family. I knew Kylie trusted the vows I made, that she believed the seal that I put on her hand when she moved in with me and we started a life together. Many of you have a similar story. Likewise, once Jesus has ratified the covenant, once he dies on the cross and is raised from the dead, now those promises are forever sealed, we can be in the presence of God. We can sort of move in to a new relationship with God. That's a beautiful thought. It's in that space, in the presence of God, where the death and resurrection are magnified and begin to make sense, where his love is this deep pool we cannot seem to dive deep enough in. It's this unexplorable beauty. The law of Moses could not afford us that. The law of Moses never brought people into God's presence the way that Jesus does. In fact, the law of Moses limited who could come close to God for their own safety. But that engagement period is over, and now because of the wedding of the Lamb, we can come into the presence of God. And what does it mean to be in the presence of God? Just as the marriage ceremony is only the means to an end, so too the sealing of the vows, Jesus' death and resurrection is only the means to the end. And that's where we get stuck. As believers, we think that every week all we're meant to do is talk about the death and resurrection, but that's the means to the end, to be in God's presence. It's not enough to have a great heavenly high priest and sacrifice but that he ushers us into the presence of God. Why did we need the high priest? Why bother with the sacrifice? But for a new life in his presence. In the old covenant, even then, the people God chose were meant to be a reflection of his own goodness. To be a people who lived in a place full of God's blessings where they shared what they had, where they practiced justice, where they worshiped rightly. Of course, they never did that because they were limited in human ability. Every aspect of the old covenant depended on the faithfulness of human beings, and so they continued to fail. Though their laws were recorded on stone and papyrus, they were never written in the heart or placed upon the mind. Though God set them free from slavery and rescued them from the hands of Egypt, they would continue generation after generation to put shackles on themselves and to walk right into cages. After all that God had done, sending prophet after prophet to remind them of his love, the people continued to break his heart. The problem is a person versus a program. 
And we get this in our day-to-day life, that we can substitute programs for people, that we can forget what the real goal is. We know that happens. And if you don't believe me, think of a few examples. Uh, First of all, do you think that a spouse would commit infidelity if their other spouse was in the room with them when they're about to cheat? Probably not. Do you think somebody would steal from their employer if their boss was standing in the room watching over their shoulder? And then one I can relate to, I have often hit my brakes when I see a radar gun poking out of a window, but I did not hit those brakes when I saw the speed limit sign a couple miles before. Although the wedding vows may have been beautiful at that ceremony, although the boss had signed week after week on those checks providing for that person's family, although I saw plenty of speed limit signs on the side of the road, sometimes none of that matters if you don't see the person in front of you. I think that's why Jesus came, to bring God's presence to mankind. He's more than just a high priest in the throne room of heaven. He left the throne room of heaven and came to be with you. What an awesome thought that we have a high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses, who has been in our shoes, who knows what we feel, who came to be with us. The only hope left for humankind was that God would come and dwell among us and so enter Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. That's why we decorate for Christmas and celebrate Emmanuel because God came to be with his people When we couldn't enter his presence, he brought his presence to us and made it possible. That leads to number three. When we have this heavenly high priest who makes this perfect sacrifice so that we can come into the presence of God, then it changes the way we live. Now we live a heavenly life. At the very least, we're invited into this heavenly life. Verse 10b through 13. So we'll pick up in the middle of verse 10. I will be their God and they shall be my people. That phrase is found all over the Bible, but it seems to pack a heavier punch right here. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, know the Lord. They'll all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. And speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. The heavenly life. This new relationship leads to a new way of living. Our relationship with Jesus is really the key that unlocks divine life. And that's not some scary theology term. Divine life. It's Zoe in John's gospel. It's abundant, eternal life. Jesus allows us into that life. And it begins now with Jesus, not just when we die. We really can become people with whom God dwells. The Bible promises that the Holy Spirit will indwell God's people. He will be with us. We can create a space as we try to do in the local church where people share what they have and practice justice and worship rightly, where we reflect God's image the way we're meant to. God is near to us. His law is placed in our minds and on our hearts. It's not just in books on pages. We won't need teachers because we'll all know and we will be known. And not not just the smart people, not just the extra religious people, from the least to the greatest. Everyone will be known by God and can know God. What a promise. How is all of that possible if not for verse 12? I will be merciful toward their iniquities. I will remember their sins no more. The only way we come into God's presence is for our sins to be forgiven. The only way we live a divine life is for death to be swallowed up in that life. And so Jesus accomplishes the impossible. This is the new arrangement. This is the new covenant. That God is with us and we are with God and we can live as God intended and be with him forever forgiven of sin. All of this made possible because of Jesus. I said the old covenant wasn't designed to last forever. And the passage quoted here is Jeremiah 31. If you noticed in Hebrews 8, it's a quote. That's from the prophet Jeremiah. 
which reveals the need for better existence, a better way of living, a greater closeness with God. And it was written hundreds of years before Jesus ever showed up. The people already knew that their covenant was temporary, that something better was coming. They were just waiting for Messiah, waiting for their Savior and their King. They knew when he comes, they wouldn't need law books and Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes any longer. The law would be in their hearts. They knew they wouldn't have to worry about knowing God and being good enough because God would forgive their sins and be with all of them from the least to the greatest. They knew this new life was coming. And in Christ, it has come. It is finished. That's the good news of the gospel. God is present with his people. You can take heart that God wants to be with you. That's not only why he sent Jesus into the world, but it's why he allowed Jesus to die on the cross and be raised in eternal life so he could be with you forever. What an awesome, awesome thought. As long as we keep doing the same old song and dance what the Israelites did for so long. We try to curry favor with God. We put up boundaries and try to protect ourselves and be perfect and prove our worthiness. And we'll never be made right with him. As long as we focus on the program, we'll miss out on the person. But because of the finished work of Jesus today, God has proclaimed that he wants to be with you and that your sins will be remembered no more. You can walk away in that freedom. Would you stand with me as we close? The old covenant and its heavy burdens, its human weaknesses, it's already vanishing from view. The prophet Isaiah speaks in unison with Jeremiah here. In chapter 43, he says, Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Even now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? The prophets were clear. God is going to do something new and improved. Jesus is the answer to our dilemma. John Eldridge is a popular Christian author, and he wrote that most Christians are still living with an old covenant view of their heart. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitfully wicked. No, it's not. Not after the work of Christ, because the promise of the new covenant is a new heart, end quote. He gets into hot water for saying things like that. But I think it's a beautiful thought. The hope we have in Christ is that we have new hearts, that he can transform everything about us and make us like himself, that he can transform us from the inside out. We needed a new covenant. We needed something new and improved. Like Kylie reminds me, sometimes we need a new refrigerator. And I know we do. But there's just something holding me back. Maybe you know what it is. Why is it I don't want to get a new refrigerator? Anybody? They're expensive. Did you say tightwad? Oh, come on. <laughs> They're expensive. Have you ever looked at the price tag on like a black stainless steel big refrigerator? They're not cheap. They're not cheap. I know we need one, and I know she deserves the best. I would want to get her what she wants, but it ain't cheap. As I read through Hebrews 8, it became so obvious to me that as God's people, we too are covered in the fingerprints of sin. That we're dented up and damaged. That our faithlessness leaks all over God's kitchen floor. And it is time for replacement. We know we need something new. We know something better is coming. But we also know we can't afford it. Because eternal life, abundant life, isn't cheap. And so God has made the way. He has offered his own son as payment. The blood of Jesus. Perfect sacrifice. Peter says it this way. You were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. God saw our need, met our need, and fulfilled the program with his own person. So we have this heavenly high priest who brings us into the presence of God himself and offers us a new and eternal life. And the only question left for you this morning, knowing how much better Jesus is, is whether or not you have received him.